Well, good evening. Uh, look, it's, it's a pleasure to be back. Uh, I have spoken before this esteemed group a couple of times, um, and each time I, I did it as mayor. And so we were talking about things from the perspective of the chief executive here in our community. My vantage point has changed a little bit, um, but hopefully what uh, we're going to talk about tonight is uh, the relevance of what we attempted to accomplish here in Salisbury and, uh, and, and that torch that has been passed and uh, what work uh, continues in here in this community. And also a perspective on nationally what's happening and how it is affecting our communities in Maryland and what we're hoping to do to address that. Um, so look, one of the great parts about this job is that I have um, traveled around the state and every single day, uh, I wake up, for those of you who don't know, by the way, right around the corner, uh, right here on Camden Avenue, that's where I live. I haven't moved, I'm never gonna move. Uh, um, I'm gonna live the rest of my life in this community if I can help it. Um, and, and I wake up right here and travel around the state and come back here every night. Um, and what I see is I see communities, whether it's Frederick or Cumberland or Oakland or uh, um, Elkton or a neighborhood in Baltimore City, uh, you name it. What I see is communities that are uh, each aspiring to better than what they have and each struggling under uh, enormous pressures uh, that they are facing right now. And most of those pressures relate to decisions that have been made um, in the past. And how do you navigate your way out of uh, the consequences of those past decisions? Well, you control what you can. And uh, you know, the last time I was here, I think I talked about three rules for remaking your city. I, I talked about um, uh, uh, the responsibility of, of city government, municipal government, in, uh, in charting that path. And today, uh, what I want to talk about is, is um, what those things are that we can control at a local level. Um, and, and I want to talk also uh, about uh, how state government is going to play an important role in, in supporting uh, that, uh, that emergence. So you, uh, you know this community well. Every single one of you uh, lives here um, uh, and you've lived here for part or all of your life, but either way you're here at a, at a formative time for you. Um, and, and, and yeah, I'm talking to the students there, but also those of us who are students of, of this community and have been here for a long time. And um, you know, what I, what I recognize is that um, we're in a place that is not terribly dissimilar from, uh, from most other communities in America. You know, when I travel around, again, what I see is the consequences of 2008. I see a community that is as subjected to um, the effects of the mortgage-backed securities driven, the real estate driven, the housing market driven financial crisis that we faced in 2008. And I see uh, communities, I see communities including ours, that are um, having a harder time digging out from the decisions made back then than they would have otherwise because of the consequences of, of COVID. Um, you all know the story. Um, you know the story that, uh, I'm trying not to move. I, I know Tom told me I had to stay still. Um, you all know the story of, of um, this community. You know my story, um, most of you. Um, and, and the brief summation is that, you know, I, I was mayor for eight years. I was an elected official for just over 10 years. And um, from when I came into office until when I left, you know, my objective was uh, to reinstill self-esteem in this community, to do it by um, demonstrating a council and mayor that could work together when I was council president and when I was uh, mayor, um, that we would no longer be in an environment of elected officials oriented at one another, slinging mud, fighting, uh, but rather who would be arm in arm, walking toward whatever vision that we could agree upon. Um, I, I did it by uh, trying to instill confidence in um, the core, that we would start with the center and getting the center right, 
that um, we would start with our economy, that we would grow that economy by uh, focusing on the arts and, and, and tourism and culture and, and revitalizing place and building great places. And, um, you know, just as I felt like just as we were starting to, you know, find our glide path, um, suddenly everything changed. And it changed in every community. You know, suddenly everything changed when, uh, when we experienced COVID and it arrived and we had to respond. And suddenly our days weren't filled with uh, talking about uh, economic development as our primary cause as uh, elected officials and public officials, but rather we became focused on public health. Um, and, and public health not in a way that mayors are used to talking about, but rather you know, responding to a, a pandemic. Um, and then just as we were becoming experts in that, on May 25th, a man named George Floyd was murdered and in Minneapolis. And again, everything changed. And it's not as if we weren't spending our time working on responding to trust and building trust in, uh, in public safety and with our police department. It, you know, we're, we're working on that day and night. But it was a new fight, a new challenge um, at a scale we hadn't seen before. We had tremendous work to do. And so we're grappling with both of those things. And uh, as if things weren't complicated enough, uh, then Uncle Sam came calling and I had to leave. And so as the, the leader of a city and a city government, I, you know, I, presence matters. Um, and so I had to pack up and leave. And I was deployed to East Africa, Somalia, Kenya, and Djibouti, and lived there for a year um, and joined a, a very small fraternity of uh, mayors in our nation's history who have been deployed to combat. Um, there have been three, um, and, and two of us uh, came home. Uh, Secretary, uh, now United States uh, Department of Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg, um, who was deployed in 2018 uh, to Afghanistan as an intelligence officer, um, and myself as the Special Technical Operations Chief in uh, Horn of Africa. Um, and, and I was lucky, by the way, to come home. Uh, Brent Taylor, uh, Mayor of North Ogden, Utah, uh, who was deployed for the fifth time um, in uh, to Afghanistan was uh, killed by the Afghan National Police officers who he was training, and he didn't come home. So when I came home, again, lucky, um, I expected to find a, a crisis driven by COVID, a public health crisis. I expected our restaurants to be dead and shut down. I expected board, boarded up small businesses, and the opposite had happened. Now, obviously, no credit goes to me. I wasn't here. Uh, but the opposite happened. And you all, those of you who are here and you were spending your money and showing your support, uh, you did something amazing and you, you kept those businesses alive. Uh, PPP loans probably helped a little bit. Uh, there were lots of factors. But, uh, but what I didn't expect was that our housing crisis would be worse. I knew it would be bad. I knew it was bad. Uh, we, we'd seen uh, you know, a, a challenging um, gap growing between population growth and our rate of constructing new housing. Um, and that uh, was getting worse. That gap was growing. That gap, by the way, is growing in every state in the union. Uh, we're not alone. Um, but it was growing right here in Salisbury. And what I knew was uh, we had to respond. And so we responded oriented on three fundamental acknowledgements. One, that we had to address symptoms. And the reason we had to address symptoms was because the weight of the housing crisis falls most squarely on the shoulders of the most vulnerable populations. At the end of the day, we don't have a expensive house crisis. We have a housing crisis. Now, the housing crisis is driven by scarcity. It's driven by uh, a uh, real, really simple supply and demand mismatch. Um, but again, the burden has fallen on the shoulders of the most vulnerable. Uh, and that's, that's our seniors, that's um, low-income families with children, that's um, returning citizens, that's uh, people aging out of foster care, that's the chronically homeless. Um, that's where the weight is falling. And simultaneously, we have an immediate challenge of addressing affordability. Like that's what people are experiencing. You all know the symptoms. Look, look at the real estate market, openrealtor.com app. Um, what, what's happening to prices? 
you know, largely. I mean, we've seen a, a slight uh, slowdown here in the last few months. Um, but what's happening with real estate prices? What's happening with rents? You know, average days on market. All of these indicators, all of these indicators are suggesting that we have uh, a supply problem, but immediately an affordability problem. And then, of course, we do have the supply problem, which has to be addressed. And so we created a, a program called Here's Home, a three-legged stool that um, on the affordability side immediately created a guaranteed minimum payment in lieu of taxes for anyone developing affordable housing. And while the city was in the practice of extending and negotiating uh, um, payment in lieu of taxes agreements, which basically reduces the tax burden for affordable housing, basically saying, okay, Government's not going to be the reason why you have to charge a higher rent, right? We're, we're going to take a, a loss uh, or reduce our gain um, because we recognize we, we've all got to contribute. So the state's going to finance it, HUD's going to put it, or there's going to be federal low-income housing tax credits leverage, but local government, we're going to put in a little something by giving you a break on your taxes. That's what a pilot is. So um, we said we'll set a guaranteed minimum threshold. Basically, take the political negotiating and grandstanding off the table. That's what we would do. Um, since that time, I've seen the city council uh, go above and beyond and offer even better deals to affordable housing units being built in the city. Second, all of the affordable housing for home ownership developers in our community, uh, which primarily our Habitat for Humanity and Salisbury Neighborhood Housing Service, we will waive 100% of your property taxes. We'll offer you a grant back of all of your property taxes. So for the carrying costs, which for these small nonprofits can be significant, but you know, it doesn't amount to a lot of money to a city, thirty to $50,000 a year for each of those organizations. But that's, that's a salary. You know, that's a, that's a, another person working to get their deals done and actually build the affordable housing units that they are trying to build. Uh, might amount to another unit or two over the course of a year or so. And so we, we extended that. That was the affordability leg of the, school, uh, leg of the stool. The second was our vulnerable populations. So recognizing that, again, we had to have sort of an immediate response, what we did was we expanded the city's relatively new permanent supportive housing program, our Housing First program, which uh, is a city voucher, which, by the way, is it's not a COVID era, it's not ARPA money, it's not you know a HUD grant or anything like that. City taxpayers are are paying for vouchers for permanent supportive housing, a lifetime commitment to the chronically homeless. Now, in Wicomico County, when we started that, there were, on average, about 100 chronically homeless people a year at any given time. It's down to about 75 now. Uh, but the city has housed 38 uh, formerly chronically homeless individuals permanently. Um, but the second piece of it was to acknowledge we can't afford to respond to all of the demand. And oh, by the way, should we? I'm not sure. Um, but, you know, what about Wicomico County? What about other municipalities? What about Worcester County next door and Somerset County? I mean, the resources and the services are all here. No doubt we're bearing some of the burden of, of, of others than just city taxpayers, right? And so we'll do our part, but you know, hopefully everybody's doing their part. But rather than try to address 100% of the need, what we figured we'd do was create a pathway in. And that pathway is a two-year, uh, 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 for lack of a better term, a two-year lease in a um, tiny home village uh, called Ann Street Village that you can see here in this picture. And I was in Georgetown, Delaware today. I uh, got my passport stamped. I was allowed to cross the border um, and go into Delaware. Um, and they've got, a, they've got a, a tiny home village with the same partner, Pallet, that's the manufacturer of these units um, up there. Uh, another great great project up there in Georgetown. Um, and there are others uh, cropping up all over the country, Austin, Texas, Los Angeles, uh, Seattle, and beyond. Um, and so uh, that, that was our attempt to address the vulnerable populations piece. And the third piece was to acknowledge that we, we have to do something about the supply problem. And um, the way we decided to address it was to acknowledge there's got to be a reason why we haven't been building in Wicomico County. And uh, yeah, you can look in 2008 and see what happened and see what was happening. But, um, but man, um, you know, we got 17,000 people in Salisbury in the workforce and 53,000 jobs. So we're a commuter city. 
more jobs than we have people. A lot of people come in for work. That's great. Except uh, in Maryland, municipalities can't levy a sales tax or an income tax. So we're not capturing anything. They're certainly using our services, but we're not capturing anything. So we can't fix that right now. We've got to change state law. And believe me, I'm an advocate for that. Uh, but what we can do is say to the home builders out there, uh, the developers out there, why, why not Salisbury? And, and frequently the answer was pretty fundamental. It was, hey, look, costs the exact same amount to build something in Salisbury that I can build in Sussex County or uh, Ocean Pines closer to the beach, and I can get a premium and make a profit on that project. Now, when I build in Salisbury, maybe I break even, maybe I lose a little, maybe I make a little profit, um, but your fees are $25,000 a housing unit in total. And we're fairly competitive. We don't have sky high fees, um, but that is a lot. That is a lot of money. Um, so our idea was to say, well, let's create a sense of urgency. Let's see if we can get the market to react to something. And the way we did that was we created a 90 day window. And in 90 days, developers and landowners had to respond to us and say, we have a proposal to build. They had to sign a two page contract. We would sign it too. And the reaction we hoped was that they would then abide by a timeline. And that timeline required about 18 months later, they had to receive site plan approval. Six months after that, they had to break ground. And then three years after that, they had to get a certificate of occupancy. Uh, all of that is a pr pretty long time to address a housing crisis, but it was as fast as we could reasonably make development timelines and permitting timelines. Um, and we'll get to my thoughts on that in just a minute. But the idea there was let's create that sense of urgency, get them to react and see what happens. And the, the benefits would not just be tied to achieving 100% of those gates or hitting 100% of those gates. They would lose 25% of each gate if they failed to meet it. So you could, still hold, you could miss something and still hold on to some of the benefit. What we wanted to do was get them into the process and if something went haywire in their project or there was serious opposition or they you know, found a, a, a brownfield issue, environmental issue, and it took a little longer, we weren't gonna make an exception, but they wouldn't lose everything. And so the reaction was this. Um, in a city with an accessible residential base of $800 million, in 90 days, we received $1.4 billion in residential development proposals. In a city that has 13,000 residential units, we received 8,000 new proposed units in 90 days. And since that time, nearly 2,000 units have been built and received their certificate of occupancy, more than any time in our city's history. And if we were to build it all out, if we were to build it all out, that would represent 23 years worth of construction of housing on the whole eastern shore of Maryland. 23 years worth. Now, I don't think 100% of it's going to get built, but that's okay. That's really not the point. The point was to address the supply issue that we were facing. And there are still lots of challenges out there. Local government can't influence the interest rates. We can't influence the price of plywood or the speed at which an electrical uh, supply box um, circuit board comes in from wherever in the world it's coming from. What we can do is control our fees. What we can do is control our permitting processes and our zoning. And so um, after all this, uh, um, I was asked to do a different job. I was asked to serve um, Governor Moore. And um, I said yes to his request for a number of reasons. Uh, one, I believed in his vision that we should be empowering Maryland to win the decade by investing in resiliency and community sustainability. I believed in his vision that we should build an economy that is competitive and equitable and fair for working Maryland families, no matter their jurisdiction. Uh, I believe that we should do a better job creating pathways uh, for opportunity and wealth building um, throughout our state. And I believe that 
This all would apply to the housing market as well. Um, and the things that DHCD was responsible for, which I'll talk about in a moment. And so we set forth five objectives that align to the governor's vision. Um, by the way, you'll hear the governor talk often about how we are going to be bold, uh, how we'll be data-driven but heart-led. Um, and, and I think we've infused those values into our execution. Um, just to give you a, a general overview before I get into these, um, these five programmatic objectives, a general overview of, of what DHCD is. Um, and, and some of you may have heard me say this before, but um, you know, I, I had a rude awakening uh, right after my, um, you never know, I, I, I didn't know at least, what this was really going to look like, becoming Secretary of Housing. And you know, you imagine like I don't know, you, you get a phone call in the middle of the night, and it's the governor, and he's like, "I need you to do, you know, go on this important mission for me." Um, well, it didn't quite look like that. Uh, so it was a series of interviews, and uh, once I kind of knew, um, once I really knew that I was getting the job, um, uh, but it wasn't official yet. The governor hadn't said it, so I couldn't say anything to the public. I decided to tell my kids. I, I decided to tell Lily and Olivia, and they were. They're in bed, we were falling asleep, they're on either side of me. And uh, um, I told them, I was just so excited. And they sat up, they were almost asleep. This is a tragic mistake. They sat up in bed and they started wailing. I mean, just like bawling their eyes out. They were very upset. And I could not figure it out. Like, what in the world is going on? This is good news. You know, it's like a promotion, you know. Good, good stuff. Like I can do big things around the state. Um, well, they didn't see it that way. And so two things dawned on me. Number one, um, I had, as long as I'd been daddy to them, I'd been mayor as well. And so it was wrapped up in my identity through their eyes. And the second is that um, nobody knows what a secretary of housing and community development does. And uh, it also, I've done some research on this. I've discovered that... Um, there is not a single children's television program that has a secretary of housing. <laughs> uh, there's a whole bunch that have mayors. Uh, uh, like Paw Patrol has two mayors. Um, by the way, 50% of the mayors in children's television programs are evil. And uh, so art, art imitates life, I think, uh, yeah. unfortunately. Um, so uh, the Department of Housing and Community Development isn't just like the governor's cabinet level advisor on housing policy. I mean, that is what we do. Um, but also, we're responsible for place-based economic development. Um, we're responsible for uh, broadband, you know, the entire utility of broadband in the state, um, and uh, the state's anti-poverty initiatives. Uh, we're also responsible for um, uh, homelessness solutions uh, and, and a variety of other uh, uh, things that um, sort of are on the edges of what you might think we do. Um, but we're, we're simultaneously responsible. For, we're an HFA, uh, Housing Finance Agency, which means we finance development. Um, so we are um, a lender. We uh, do about $2.5 billion a year in lending, uh, small business, uh, um, as well as uh, mortgages. A billion of that a year is mortgages. Um, and um, uh, we also do a significant amount of development finance. So we actually finance the affordable housing units that are built in this state. And so I want to talk to you about these five objectives, which are going to change the way in which we do that work. Uh, number one, it's to provide shelter for all. That is more than just a broad aspiration. It's an acknowledgement that our ethic has to be about those vulnerable populations. We have to be focused on uh, changing the way in which we use limited federal dollars that flow into our state, the limited resources that we're entrusted with by our, our citizens, whether that means uh, shifting away from emergency shelter. Emergency shelter is the primary way that we respond to homelessness. And that just means that you know we're, we're meeting you where you're at, but oftentimes we're perpetuating a cycle of homelessness. We're not saying, hey, we have resources and services that will get you out of this. We're saying, we're going to help you tonight, but we know we might see you again in three weeks. 
or three months or three years. We have to shift that. The second expanding affordable housing is maybe a simple thing to say, but it's about that supply crisis. That there are two categories of barriers to affordable housing, to getting out of what we've built since 2008, the, the hole we've dug since 2008. And those barriers are cost, which by the way, we need to play a critical role in financing more affordable housing. And second, local barriers. And here's what I wanna tell you. Uh, the local barriers to affordable housing are not enshrined in local government because we elect and appoint people that don't want there to be affordability for their constituents. That's not, that's not what happens. You know, yes, some people who might wear, you know, proudly wave the flag of NIMBYism. Uh, we all know NIMBYism, right? Yeah. Uh, um, yes, th those folks might get elected to government positions or hired into government positions. Also, you might get people that uh, um, are sort of anti-smart growth and want to build everything everywhere. Um, and you might get some folks in the middle that uh, want to acknowledge that we have a housing crisis, a supply crisis, and that we have to protect our limited natural resources and we want to build smart. But the reason why we have local barriers to affordable housing and addressing the affordability crisis that we have and the supply crisis we have is that, um, let me introduce you to this animal called the human being. And if you've never met them before, they are absolutely petrified of change. And they don't want anything to change. Actually, I'll tell you, uh, there, there's two sides to this coin. Mayor Brandon Scott said the, uh, the other day at um, the Maryland Municipal League conference, he said, uh, I've, uh, I've learned two things since I became mayor of Baltimore. And number one is that people are scared of change. Nobody wants anything to change. And the second is that everybody wants everything to change right now. And both things are true. But with respect to a fear of change, the reason why that affects local government so much is that your mayors and your council members and your commissioners and your aldermen and your burgesses, did you know we had burgesses in Maryland? Uh, that's an actual thing. It's like a mayor um, in Western Maryland. They grocery shop and they sit at council tables right across from their constituents. And so decisions are in their face. And most of the power to shape development decisions sits with them. Not a governor, not a senator, not a delegate, not a congressperson. It's at the local level. And so if we're going to move the needle, then we also have to make permitting processes and zoning that is designed to actually produce the communities that A, respond to the affordable housing crisis, and B, make actual places where people wanna live, and B, and that are sensitive to, again, the fact that we're not making any more land, and we have to use what we have efficiently. Number three, right the wrongs of the past. I can see why I like that too. Let me, let me tell you about why this is important. In Maryland, <laughs> I'll repeat myself. In Maryland, we are ground zero for redlining. Uh, redlining is, is one policy tool. And it's a policy tool uh, visited upon families and neighborhoods by government and by the private sector, by the finance industry, uh, by the mortgage industry. And um, it often, we often talk about righting the wrongs of the past through, uh, in terms of redlining. But let me tell you, there's so much more to it. We cemented the discrimination and segregation that happened as a result of redlining through subsequent policy decisions. If you think that we set the course of some Maryland families apart from others because of the color of their skin, because they were uncreative, bureaucrats at the helm, you got another thing coming. The fact is it was deliberate, it was designed, it was explicitly produced that way. We did that intentionally. Government did that intentionally. 
And so the only way out is to deliberately design counteracting forces. But like I said, we cemented after redlining, we, we built urban highways that carved through neighborhoods. And no, by the way, not just the highway to nowhere in Baltimore or examples in New York City. We did it right here in Salisbury. Route 13 and Route 50 erased neighborhoods. California was cut through. Georgetown was cut through. Georgetown was erased. Georgetown's gone. Uh, there, there's one or two buildings left that could be called original to Georgetown. And so after that, we said, oh, here comes the government. We're going to do better. And we, we used urban renewal dollars in the 80s and 90s. And most of what that did was it erased the limited bits of community wealth and, and, and community in general that remained in the hands of black and brown families. And we erased that. Um, and so you saw entire properties like Lot 30 in Salisbury, uh, what's today a parking lot. That was a, that was a, uh, a bastion of black business, gone. Um, we tore all the buildings down, you know, bought, uh, bought everything for pennies on the dollar, uh, erased the site, and there's nothing there today. Um, and so we have to, again, deliberately counteract. Number four, make lovable places. And while this may sound like a nicety, here's why this is so important. The end of the day, government will never have enough resources. We will never have enough resources to do all the things we need to do. And so we have to leverage private investment. We have to attract people who vote with their wallets and pocketbooks. We have to attract investors. We have to attract private investment to make great places. I do believe great places win. The competitive fight for, for dollars, for people, for growth, for all of that. But we, we want to make lovable, we must make lovable places because not only do we want to attract that investment, but we have a history of building garbage when government's at the helm. Places that are devoid of dignity and humanity, that don't acknowledge the humanity of the people who live in them. You know, public housing has the reputation it has, and affordable housing has the, the spillover effects of being viewed as a negative, not just because we have concentrated poverty, and oh, by the way, we have, but moreover, because we made it look like that. We made it look like po concentrated poverty. We said, this doesn't matter. Don't worry about it. Government's gonna build it, we'll build it cheap. Don't you worry about it. No wonder people don't want that in their communities. No wonder people don't want it in their backyards. We can do better. Design can lend dignity to people's lives. And lastly, connect all Marylanders. And the reason this is important is not just because my department is responsible for uh, broadband, but also because if we're gonna create economic opportunity people, for people, I think we have to acknowledge that what was, and is still important, the utility of economic development, water, water and sewer, for generations, for 150 years, today, the utility of economic competitiveness is broadband, access to the digital economy, access to knowledge. And so we must ensure, and we will by 2028, that 100% of all locations in this state, including the 21,000 remaining, are connected to high-speed broadband. It is absolutely fundamental to ensuring that we address uh, the economic uh, mismatch that we have in terms of opportunity. So I told you that Maryland families are facing a housing crisis, and so now we go about the business of addressing it. Um, my department is, uh, has, has worked on developing a framework, a uh, set of building blocks, a budget, and legislative priorities. And no, I cannot reveal all of those to you tonight because there's a process and I have a boss. But what we are working on is, uh, is a series of policy initiatives executive actions, uh, budget uh, priorities, and legislative actions that will address rising rents and home prices, the fact that we are short 120,000 housing units in this state right now. And what we have seen is, again, increasing burden on those who can least afford to get themselves out of it. And we're going to do it through four uh, categories for building blocks. And these will not surprise you at all since the, there should be some correlation to those 
uh, programmatic objectives I just mentioned. We're going to do it with scale. We're going to do it by revitalizing disinvested communities and righting the wrongs of the past. We're going to do it by housing the most vulnerable Marylanders and by building wealth through home ownership. The governor often shares a story, and I think this is a really important one. Um, and he tells about a time when he was giving his mom a lot of trouble when he was a kid. He was getting into trouble, and things were getting bad at home, and she decided she needed to send him away. And so his grandparents in New York mortgaged their house in Brooklyn, mortgaged their home, and used that money to pay for him to go to military school. And by doing so, he went down a pathway that led him ultimately to Government House in Annapolis. It's, it's not a rags to riches story. He's made his own wealth, but it's certainly a rags to absolute success and opportunity story. And a home enabled that. Not a mortgage so much. Um, yes, there's a mortgage as a part of the story, but home ownership ultimately. So we all know the underlying causes uh, we addressed uh, that a moment ago, the barriers that you've seen, um, the, the symptoms, rising rents, et cetera. Um, and we have all seen the headlines and know that this is an absolute necessity for us. So some of the tools that we are putting into place include the um, Emerging Developer Loan Fund. This is a way that we are helping communities and the people who are members and residents of their community help to build their way out. Most of the programs that my department has had for development historically go to very, very large development firms. Those that have been doing the work for 20 years, they've figured out all the nuances, they know how to win the you know, tenth of a point that they need in the scoring application to, to get the deal. And yeah, they're still going to build projects, mostly because they do it more affordably than the next guy. But the Emerging Developer Loan Fund is so critical, critical because it says to people living in neighborhoods, we will give you mentorship and we will give you cash. And we will underwrite your projects to buy homes on your block or in your neighborhood to renovate them, redevelop them for home ownership ultimately. This program with a $3 million seed is resulting in 500 new affordable homes and apartments in uh, the state of Maryland just this year. Uh, one of my favorite examples is Black Women Build, uh, a really incredible business in Baltimore City uh, and one of the grantees. Um, Black Women Build uh, uh, takes women, uh, women of color in Baltimore City, uh, teaches them trades, teaches them skills, and helps them buy homes on their block, neighbors of theirs that have been vacant and uh, abandoned, renovate them, sell them, and get into the development uh, business. You'll also see us continue to finance projects like uh, a project right here in Salisbury. Uh, we, uh, we will continue to build, uh, acknowledging that there's no other way out of this but scale, but through scale. And so we've just got to build better. We don't have to build places that are devoid of character, devoid of detail any longer. We can build places that have amenities and dignity. Uh, no longer do you have to picture uh, the blocks of devoid of detail uh, public housing like Perkins Somerset Old Town in Baltimore, um, but rather we can build places that have actual amenities, uh, actual resources and assets that are difficult to differentiate from market rate apartments. And oh, by the way, as frequently as possible, we should be integrating market rate units and affordable units into the same developments. We're going to continue to build senior housing and redevelop senior housing, like right here in Salisbury in Gateway Village. Again, places that have actual quality amenities and no longer are devoid of the things that make it uh, desirable to live in. Next. We have to recognize that we can create opportunity and pathway for economic success. The state of Maryland is going to put over $60 million in grants this year into communities for economic place-based uh, development. 
Uh, we are going to do it in a way that is different from the way we've done it before by looking carefully at geographic areas that have been underinvested and disinvested in for a long time. Uh, we've talked a little bit tonight about redlining. We've talked about uh, how federal, state, local government was complicit in that work and, um, and how it's affected every community in this state, not just the Baltimore butterfly of East and West Baltimore, but even right here in Wicomico County. And that disinvestment requires dollars to turn it around. And so our greater than $60 million investment in place-based economic development this year will be doing everything from pre-development design to demolition, to site acquisition, to financing construction uh, and, and uh, reducing the gap that many of these developments have. Uh, we will be putting it into home ownership on blocks like this one in Baltimore City. We'll be putting it into, uh, we'll be putting it into uh, again, mixed income and mixed use development, as well as community centers and uh, catalytic investments in neighborhoods. We're seeing the fruits of that labor already with our direction of dollars into the neighborhoods that have been most underinvested in for a long time. Uh, one of the great projects uh, that I'm really excited about is a community center, um, BAM, in, uh, in Talbot County. Um, and, you know, Lynn, I, I think you got a, a real gem in this project in, in Talbot County. I didn't know you were going to be in the audience tonight, but uh, we're, we're really proud to be invested in um, this great community center. And then later in the housing uh, behind it. Uh, we will continue to invest in small business. Um, one of the great programs that I'm really proud of um, in, uh, in um, our department and something that we're going to be targeting even more to underinvested places is Project Restore. Um, and Project Restore was a COVID era design, but something we're going to continue doing um, to take businesses and fill vacant spaces. So by investing in undercapitalized businesses uh, and filling vacant spaces, I think we are more likely to, uh, to change and turn around uh, those core commercial corridors, those main streets, those core communities that have been undercapitalized for a long time. We pair that, by the way, let me go back if I can. We pair that, by the way, with lending programs um, like Neighborhood Business Works and the new state small business credit initiative to actually be a bank for small businesses. Um, and then uh, with respect to uh, providing shelter for all, it is our core mission to ensure that all of the work that we are doing uh, helps people to achieve their uh, objective of, of safety, of comfort, of shelter, and um, we're doing it with more resources than we've ever been entrusted with before. This year, $7.1 million in homelessness solutions programs, and for the first time, prioritizing permanent supportive housing. Uh, for the first time, we are uh, reducing barriers to entry into housing um, by uh, adopting a philosophy of housing first. And by the way, housing first doesn't mean housing only. There's, there's a second, and there's a third, and there's a fourth. We've got to bring wraparound services. Um, to bear. And we'll be talking more about that after this budget, this next budget gets announced. And lastly, uh, once again, I want to dive into this, this uh, critical piece for, of home ownership. Um, our home ownership programs, you're going to see also continue to be hyper focused um, in a way that they haven't been before on marginalized neighborhoods, underinvested places that exist, by the way, in all 24 jurisdictions in this state. The Maryland Mortgage Program um, has been incredibly successful, uh, historically clearing 60% of, of mortgages at providing first-time home buyers who are also minority, uh, providing a pathway to home ownership. This past year, we broke 80%, and we're going to continue to strive to ensure that we are narrowing the racial home ownership gap and subsequently narrowing the racial wealth gap with the work that we do. By the way, uh, for, for those of you who are not a homeowner yet, first time home buyers in Maryland, um, this is a great program. 
It provides you down payment and closing cost assistance. It also provides you with a competitive interest rate better than what you're going to find at most banks. And for anybody with, anybody with a student loan here? Okay, a couple in the room. Uh, we have the Smart Buy program, uh, which today offers $50,000, $50,000 to pay down your student debt. Now, some of you may have more than that. I recognize that, but $50,000 is not, uh, not too bad. Um, and that $50,000 to pay down your college debt um, is paired with the competitive interest rate, by the way. We don't need to see that guy. Um, <laughs> That was, that was an announcement uh, that uh, I'm going to talk about in just a second for uh, connectivity. Um, we, received, we just received $267 million to extend service to uh, the remaining 21,000 unserved locations in our state. Um, and the, the final connectivity piece of what we're doing is, uh, is focused on ensuring that every single business, farmhouse, chicken house, house in this state has high speed broadband access. Every single property, there are 21,000 left. And most of them are in rural Maryland or in public housing. And so we've announced a long driveway program, uh, a program called Home Stretch for long driveways in rural areas uh, to pay for the broadband service to get down your driveway when the ISP won't. And public housing to wire right up to the unit because what a lot of these, uh, uh, ISPs have said is once we get to the building, we're done. But in, in public housing, uh, in Baltimore City, Frederick, Crisfield, Annapolis, those are the places where public housing is most concentrated, where we want to make sure that we are providing actual access to the folks living in that unit. So we have an interconnected response to the crises, the multitude of crises our state is facing. The core of it is a su supply shortage for housing that exacerbates all of the other things we've talked about. But critically, it's also about economic competitiveness. It's also about ensuring that we are righting the wrongs of the past. And it's about building lovable places where people can achieve opportunity in a way that we have not built for in the past, or we've done so inequi inequitably at best. So my friends, I appreciate your time, your attention. And I'm here to answer any questions you have. Thank you so much for having me tonight. Question. And we can talk about anything you want to talk about. Yes. Um, I have help. I have help. Uh, so Allison uh, Foster, our wonderful director of communications, who used to be uh, with the city of Salisbury. Um, ben Penserga at the back of the room, deputy communications director. Um, they certainly help. And um, admittedly, I've got a style uh, that's probably a little different from, from others. So um, everything, almost everything that you see is a variation from a known point. Um, if you look at my slides from last year, you'll, you'll see, I, I like to do pictures with not, without a lot of words. Um, I think it's better to look at, or like one thing, one word, one, you know, not a lot of text. Um, uh, so I didn't create this slide. Um, <laughs> that's not to critique this. The team did a great, yes, yes. Uh, uh, graphic work that I couldn't possibly dream of doing. So great question. Though. Yes. I, was, um, I think you can correct me if I have the wrong assumptions. It's been a while. Most of the time, people who buy houses start out in apartments, and sometimes in public housing, it will accumulate enough wealth in order to buy. These public, one of the problems I know with public housing, you can hear I was in Brooklyn, and uh, there's a lot of that there, is the management and supervision of those houses so they remain solid structures, which keeps those communities together. <laughs> Is there something on the other end of your uh, plan that you couldn't get to tonight uh, with regard to just that kind of problem? Who manages these things and who keeps them um, together so they remain nice places to live? Well, so, so great question, um, you know, about management and operations. So I'm going to start this off by saying both public and private owners of multifamily buildings can be bad 
at what they do. Um, and they more often than we would like are. Uh, but government's got a really bad track record with managing housing, a really bad track record. And not just in ancient history, like recent history. Um, and so the largest affordable housing um, owners, uh, excuse me, the largest public housing owners, the largest PHAs in Maryland are um, Crisfield Housing Authority, HABC, Housing Authority of Baltimore City, uh, and that's not in order, HABC is the largest, um, Frederick Housing Authority, and Annapolis Housing Authority, HACA, the Housing Authority of the City of Annapolis. Um, those are the biggest ones. Uh, you know, then you got really tiny ones like Wicomico County, it's, it's small, uh, Talbot County is fairly small. Um, Hagerstown is probably actually number five on that list, um, but you know, there's an extraordinary concentration of units in the first four that I mentioned, um, and it makes it really tough for them to operate. Um, you know, there's no margins. You know, they're not they're not playing with profit. You know, trying to they're not. You know, it's not like you know greedy developer landlord who's just like raking in the cash. Um, they've got to put everything that they earn back into their buildings, and still they're terrible. Um, and I, I, you know, I know this is being recorded and. Uh, maybe I should be more politically correct with my language, but it, but they're bad. Uh, there are lawsuits, you know, lawsuits that are going on right now in Annapolis um, and in Baltimore City, and there's some bad press that's come out recently um, in the city uh, that are just a precursor to what could happen in Frederick or Crisfield. Um, Crisfield recently, a couple years ago, uh, went through a, a HUD takeover, uh, a reorganization because of, you know, financial issues, maybe improprieties, um, you know, all kinds of bad stuff going on. Um, and so uh, when, we, when we don't take care of these properties, they degrade faster. Um, other, uh, you know, it, it compounds so fast because as soon as there's, you know, as soon as there is a, a lack of quality in the built environment, there's you see a degradation of all kinds of other things. Um, people can't make ends meet, so they, uh, you know, there, there's other things that happen: drug dealing, and the, the cycle of poverty only gets worse, and um, and and everything collapses. And you you see these places become no man's land, you know, at times, um, not safe to go in or out of. Uh, it's really bad. It's really bad. And that just plays into perceptions that people have too, right, of, of public housing. There are great examples of public housing, by the way. Uh, but, the, but the rule, the by and large, is what you're describing. And so I'm a believer that we should be s steering many of these to uh, private uh, partnerships, pr public-private partnerships, or to management agreements um, where the um, uh, choice neighborhoods are being um, uh, uh, Levy choice neighborhood dollars are being used. Um, choice neighborhood is the latest version of RAD, a rental assistance demonstration. Um, so choice neighborhoods, uh, planning grants, and then uh, implementation dollars means they're they're basically taking uh, uh, taking public housing units, redeveloping, um, uh, guaranteeing a right a right of return um, to the families, moving the families, redeveloping, and then deconcentrating poverty by integrating. Um, mixed income, so market rate, um, and then varying degrees of affordable, uh, whether it's, you know, sort of 81-20 AMI, 80 to 120 percent area median income target, and then uh, more deeply subsidized, uh, like a HV, HCV, housing choice voucher, or a project-based voucher solution. And so um, I think by doing that, you end up with the better of the two. Is it perfect? Probably not. Probably not. But you end up with the better of the two. Uh, an example of that is Booth Street um, right here in Salisbury. So Booth Street, um, just west of the city, um, was redeveloped not too long ago. Public housing project torn down. Um, and then they actually geographically dispersed too. Um, uh, uh, half of the units went to the east side of town. Half of the units were redeveloped on site. Um, and, uh, and then they integrated other income levels onto the property. And you know, much more attractive solution. Um, you know, you've, we've seen a lot of the problems, uh, calls for service, according to the sheriff's office, calls for service plummeted in those locations. Um, and so you end up with something better. Again, right. perfect, probably not. That, uh, in places where there's uh, some sort of institutional 
public partnership of unions. Um, the way this garment district union is one place I know a lot of people that produce low, medium income, and then those people, those units seem to stay really stable for long periods of time, and they do include people who aren't in that unit. I don't know why that is. But, you know, I just, just yeah, there, there aren't enough cooperative housing models that are being developed, but there is a piece of legislation that is going to come up this session. Uh, it did last year, and I think it's, it, it's probably got legs this year, or at least a greater chance of succeeding. I think it was Delegate Vaughn Stewart. Um, uh, but he, uh, uh, he wants to see Maryland lead on those cooperative housing models, um, but it takes resources, it takes money. And so his bill would create the programming for us to support it with financing. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Sure. So the previous two Democratic governors have their fingerprints all over smart growth. One of them even claims to have invented smart growth. <laughs> That's, that's a great question. So uh, you're, you're so right that um, uh, Governor Glenn Denning, um, I believe, uh, is, could be called the godfather, whether he invented it or not, like the godfather of, of smart growth. Um, and, and Governor O'Malley, uh, I, I think it's fair to say, took a, a very data-driven but also um, Bay-centric, environment-centric approach to um, uh, smart growth. Um, did a lot for land conservation, did a lot for, um, you know, uh, good planning. Um, so uh, the smart growth sub-cabinet, which is comprised of members of the cabinet, um, and uh, of which I'm the, uh, I, I sit on the, the sub-cabinet, um, and there's legislation to make the Secretary of Housing the permanent vice chair of that sub-cabinet, and the Secretary of Planning the permanent chair, um, and I'm a big fan of that legislation. Um, so the su smart growth subcabinet is grappling with this question right now. And what I think it requires is updating the, the visions of, of um, smart growth um, to emphasize things that we, by looking at the, the governor's priorities and values, to emphasize those things. Um, and, and really, it comes down to two things. Um, Resilience, you know, the governor has, has said we're going to be the greenest state in the, un uh, in the union. What does that mean? It means a lot of different things. Uh, it means a lot of different responsibilities and policy changes that we have to adopt. Um, but uh, Climate Solutions Now Act is a great indicator of where we're going. Um, you know, aggressive uh, greenhouse gas reduction goals, more aggressive than almost any other state. Um, that, that's where we're headed. And so uh, climate resilience, I think, is, is a big area. And the second is equity. And, and when, I, when I hear us talk about equity, um, you know, I, I want that for people too. I want equity. But what I really want is justice. What I really want is us to acknowledge that we've visited an, an injustice upon people and we've got to counteract that and fix it. And it's a it's a hard pill to swallow when it comes down to actually talking about the meat of that. Um, but I believe we can't talk about smart growth to tomorrow if it's just about land use and it's just about urban design and it's just about transportation policy. It's got to be deeper than that. It's got to reach more people. It's got to be more impactful. And I think um, from my perspective, the most important thing we can do is move justice to the front of the agenda. And so I think what you're going to see is uh, some moves to do that, um, and to also broaden uh, the terminology. Uh, you know, Maryland's grappled with sustainable communities, smart growth. Uh, you know, what what are we? What do we want to be? Um, so I, I don't know, but may, I think we'll land on one of those, and the other will probably, you know, move to a historical uh, term. Um, I, I don't know which, but there's two different schools of thought, and we'll see. One of them will win. Or neither will win, and we'll have the same conversation in four to eight years. Well, thank you all so much. Thanks again.